Hi gentlemen, I hope that when you watch this video, you and your family are healthy and well. This is the final uh, fourth and final lecture for this chapter, Unit 3, um, on St. Paul and the life of St. Paul. Uh, last time we were together, just as a quick review, the big focus was on the Jerusalem Council. And this was really one of the first kind of large decisions that as a church had to be decided. Uh, it occurred in the year 49 AD. So we know our Lord Jesus Christ ascended into heaven um, in the year 33 AD. So this is this is an early issue. Um, the issue was essentially St. Paul was really recruiting a large amount of Gentiles into the church. So the issue, uh, the issue was whether or not these um, incoming Gentiles would have to essentially become Jewish first, um, meaning do they have to be circumcised? Would they have to follow uh, the Jewish dietary laws? Um, the ones present, they, the, the council was actually held in Jerusalem. We see that St. Paul, St. Peter, and St. James were there, as well as other church leaders. We see that uh, they prayed to the Holy Spirit for, for guidance during this. And the end result was that Gentiles do not have to um, essentially become Jewish first. They don't have to be circumcised. They don't have to follow the, the dietary laws. The two things were that they were not allowed to eat meat that were offered to idols or blood that was offered up for sacrifice to idols. And they had to avoid any type of unlawful marriage. Um, what happens after this point, you know, before this point, uh, on most of the church was predominantly, uh, the early Christian church was predominantly Jewish. Their Saturdays were spent in synagogues and their Sundays were spent in house churches. Now what happens is after the, um, after the Jerusalem council, the Gentiles, Christians join the churches in great numbers and they start to pull away from Jewish practices. So really now, um, the worship day becomes Sunday. This also is a period of persecution that begins and the early Christians uh, what often would happen is they were being forced to offer sacrifices to the Roman emperors because back then the Roman emperors were viewed as God and you would, you'd had to sacrifice. Now, many Christians considered this to be a violation of the first commandment, which is that you should no have, have no other God above thee. So as a result, the Christians refused to um, offer sacrifices to the Roman emperors. And because of this, they were killed. And these individuals um, are really are known as martyr and martyr. A martyr is anyone who willingly dies specifically because of their love of Christ, whether um, be just simply for being Christian or not. And this early persecution, which started in Jerusalem, really spread all throughout the empire. And we know that St. Stephen was the first ever Christian martyr. He was stoned to death. We know that St. Paul, before he converted, um, when he was a, a, um, a Jewish authority, he was there at the stoning of St. Stephen. So today we're going to just really take one major slide of notes uh, and we're going to watch a very short video and that will call it a day. Th your classwork number four assignment will be simply to submit your uh, class notes as proof that you've kept up to date. Really the big deliverable this week, uh, the big thing you have to turn in, um, will be um, either Tuesday or Wednesday. I'm going to post a at-home 100-point essay exam, uh, and that will be due either Thursday or Friday, depending on what day I give it to you. And then there will probably only be one other assignment this week uh, associated. It'll be a journal associated with modern-day Christ, uh, um, Christian persecution. So really, you're really only going to have three assignments. One is to turn in your class notes. Um, the second will be to take the test and then there'll be a journal and that'll that'll be it for the week okay so um the results of persecutions so basically um for the beginning years of the church there was much persecution uh tertullian basically said the blood of the martyrs is seed of christians so meaning it was amazing to individuals who watched these christians joyfully accept and face death um, many were often heard to be singing hymns and praising the Lord as they were being persecuted. Um, many could not understand why they wouldn't just pay homage to the Roman God, uh, um, emperor, and they just couldn't understand this kind of faith. And what happened is people were inspired by this. Um, and many say that the blood of these martyrs helped the church grow because people said, people asked themselves, wow, what 
is so unique that this is the way Christians are living so joyfully, even under such suffering and such persecution. So as a result, um, many individuals joined the church in great numbers, but Christians really had to meet um, in secret and they, they continued to grow and they continued to care for each other. So probably another extremely large event occurs in the year of three, thir 313 AD. Um, and this is called the Edict of Milan. So um, this was the decree of Emperor Constantine. So Emperor Constantine, as we know it, is the first emperor of the Roman Empire who is Christian. He's not a great Christian, but he's Christian. And what he turns around and does is he comes out with the Edict of Milan. And it's important to note, this does not um, make Christianity the, the religion of the Roman Empire. That's not what this is. Um, also, some people say, some people who are anti anti Catholic say that the edict, that um, the Emperor Constantine was the one who created the Catholic Church. That's completely false. Um, Jesus Christ created the Catholic Church. We know that very early on, Catholic, from just 10, 15 years after Christ ascended, the Catholic Church existed and they called themselves the Catholic Church. So, what is the Edict of the Milan? A Milan? Essentially, Saint, um, excuse me, Emperor Constantine basically granted freedom of religion and which gave a legal status to Christians to be able to practice their religion without persecution. Okay. So this was done. Um, the emperor right before Emperor Constantine, that was Emperor Diocletian. He was extremely um, horrible towards Catholics and he persecuted many of them, often throwing them to the lions uh, during the Roman gladiator games. And what he did, so when Emperor Constantine comes in and converts and becomes a Christian. Uh, um, he comes out with this Edict of Milan, which says Catholics have a right to freedom of religion. Um, and, and they gave legal status so that they're allowed to practice their religion without persecution. So as a result of, so this was a huge um, um, declaration. Again, it did not make Christianity the official religion of the Roman Empire that happens later. Um, but as a result, the church does expand greatly. And as a result, the needs of the church changed. So now these house churches are too small. So after the Edict of Milan, we start to see the construction and building of larger church buildings, more like the churches we have today. Also, we see the need as many, many, many Christians join in larger numbers. We see this need for Christian education to become more formalized. So we know a catechumenate catechumenates an important vocabulary word. This was the process of which they brought adults into the church. Um, and we know that now we start to see infants coming in and infant baptism happens. We see that the liturgy, which is a, a or the mass continues to develop and get refined, but really still has the basic essence or presence that had always exist, uh, existed from the beginning. So really the, the Edict of Milan resulted in a huge expansion of the church. Did the Edict of Milan, did Constant, um, Emperor Constantine create the Catholic Church? Absolutely not. Jesus Christ did. Did the Edict of Milan make Catholicism the official religion of the Roman Empire? No. The Edict of Milan essentially granted um, freedom of religion and a legal status for Christians to be able to practice their religion without undergoing persecution. Okay. So that is essentially the basics. I'm going to show you a very short three minute video and then this lecture will be done. Um, like I said, classwork number four will essentially be for you to turn in your class notes or basically this PowerPoint and then keep your eye out for when I post that test and one last journal. All right, here we go. And this video is just going to review some of the things that we just covered. A claim that you often encounter in the writings of certain anti-Catholics, particularly among fundamentalists, is the claim that the Emperor Constantine founded the Catholic Church. Now, this is an impossible claim to sustain if you know anything about the history of this period. It's clear that when Constantine came around, the early 4th century, the early 300s, that there was already a Christian church in existence and that this church called itself the Catholic Church. Elsewhere, we've talked about the fact that the term Catholic actually dates 
to the second half of the first century. So the church had already long been identifying itself as the Catholic Church. And not only that, it taught the same things that the Catholic Church teaches today. If you look at the teachings of the fathers of this period on issue after issue, from the Eucharist to baptism to the authority of the Pope to the unique role of Mary, on just subject after subject, the church fathers can be shown long before the time of Constantine to be espousing the same views that the Catholic Church teaches today. Now, Constantine did have an important role in this time period. He was the first Christian emperor, and he was also the emperor who ended the age of persecutions. Prior to this point in history, Christians had been subject to periodic persecutions by the Roman emperors, and Constantine's predecessor, Diocletian, had inaugurated a particularly fierce persecution of the early Christians. Constantine then became a Christian. He wasn't the best Christian by any means, but what he did do was announce the Edict of Toleration, also known as the Edict of Milan, the same place that St. Ambrose was later bishop of. According to the Edict of Milan, Christians were now a tolerated group. They were not going to be subject to persecutions, and consequently the church was able to blossom in an even greater way than it already had been blossoming. Some people have the idea that Constantine made Christianity or Catholicism the official religion of the empire. That's not true. Eventually, Catholicism did become the official religion of the state, but that's something that occurred later on. All Constantine did was announce toleration. That was something they were fortunate to have in their day, and it's something that Christians are fortunate to have in our day as well, when in so many parts of the world, the church is again facing persecution. Okay. So I guess the last thing um, that I just want to say is essentially to bring it to your attention that the Christian church, the Catholic church, we are still being persecuted around the world. Um, it's hard for people, I guess, in the United States to, to think about that when it's such a large part of this country's heritage and, and so many individuals are Christian within this nation. Um, but make no mistake about it. And we saw that last year uh, with the Sri Lanka bombings on Easter, um, all the Catholic churches that were hit, um, on, uh, which was absolutely horrible. But there are so many uh, country, uh, countries throughout um, the world in which Christians today are either killed or forced into labor camps just for believing in Jesus Christ, just for their faith. So again, the after, after the main focus at first at the beginning of the week is going to be your take home exam. But after that, there will be a short journal um, that really gets you to, to take a look at this modern day issue. Okay, so have I hope all of you are well, stay safe. If you have any issues, um, send me an email. Also, please, this is a great time to catch up any, uh, any work since the workload is, is going to be a little bit lighter this week. Um, best of luck and most of all, be well, gentlemen. God bless.